Hello, this is Alex Bainbridge from Green Left. I'd like to welcome you all to this third episode of our new Green Left show, where we're going to be tackling a range of uh, topical issues. Today we're dealing with big technology and democracy. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge that we're filming this show on stolen Aboriginal land. Uh, I'm coming to you from Jagger and Turbul country, but all around the country this is stolen land. It always was, always will be Aboriginal land, and we pledge our solidarity with ongoing struggles for justice. Today we have three guests who should be uh, make it up for a very interesting discussion. We have uh, Gody Gandabir, who's an activist and writer with Green Left. Also Lizzie O'Shea, she's a lawyer and writer, and also the chair of Digital Rights Watch. And Alex Warnsborough, he's the author of Capitalism and the Enchanted Screen, Myths and Allegories of the Digital Age. He's also a casual lecturer in screen theory. Uh, anybody who's turned on the internet this week has probably seen advertisements from Google who are complaining that the government's proposed law would break the internet. And they've also likened the Google empire to a, you know, what it'd be like for a friend to recommend a coffee shop to another friend. Uh, can you perhaps uh, begin, Gody, by just talking to us about the latest news in this case and also your views on this issue? Sure. Um, so the latest news is that Google and Scott Morrison have um, uh, basically begun to discuss um, actually accepting the code. Um, so Scott Morrison was in contact with Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Google, and they have said that um, they are recommitting to Australia and would not um, pull their search functions. And I believe that the letter um, written by the Australia, uh, Google Australia CEO, Mel Silva, that was um, an open letter to the public, has been taken down. So this is basically what the government is, the government legislation is going to mandate that Google and Facebook pay a certain amount of money to uh, news organisations uh, when they uh, you know, when they post links to, to news organisations and supposedly this is to pay for, for journalism. Now, uh, taking money off the big tech giants doesn't seem like a bad idea to me and uh, supporting journalism seems like a good thing in general. But I wonder, Lizzie, maybe do you have any comments about the issues involved in this? I mean, like, is this Scott Morrison accidentally doing the right thing for a change or is this Scott Morrison taking the side of uh, News Corporation against uh, Google and Facebook? Or how would you see the issues, Lizzie? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk about this because I think a lot of the mainstream news coverage of this is quite confusing and uh, wrong-footed, in part because the mainstream media organisations have a lot to benefit if this code is passed. So this came out of the ACCC's review into the big tech platforms, which had a lot of great recommendations actually within it to kind of in improve the ecosystem in which we occupy in the digital age. Um, it was, I think, perhaps the least appealing of the possible recommendations. So it's been on the card for, cards for a while. And I can completely understand the need to address the decline in media and in particular investigative journalism that we've seen as a result of advertising dollars moving away from newsrooms and news organisations towards big tech platforms. You know, regional journalism has suffered, lots of specialist beats like court reporting and uh, science reporting, I think, could be improved. All these things are a real problem. My worry is that this particular proposal to essentially set up a system of private transfers between uh, big tech platforms and media organisations is not the solution. If we're worried about journalism, we should be funding it properly, including from government at an arm's length, um, in an arm's length manner. If we're worried about big tech platforms making too much money, we should be taxing them. And if we're worried about the implications of a data extractive economy where your personal information is mined and then used uh, to, to make money for advertisers, then I think we need to, to regulate privacy better and improve people's right to uh, take control of their information. So what I see here is a situation where Scott Morrison was kind of keen to appease his mates at News Corp, who've been a big driver of this particular legislative or legislative proposal. Uh, and it's very easy to give big tech platforms a kick uh, because lots of people feel uh, very strongly that they take advantage, that they make too much money, and they don't like what online life looks like when it's dominated by these platforms. So I think there's a third way there, which we can talk about more if you're interested, but that's where I'd start in terms of trying to understand what's at play. I mean, one thing that just sort of springs to my mind, if, if, uh, if these news organisations like News Corp and Channel 9, whatever, get a big increase in funding, does anybody actually believe that the regional newspapers are going to open up again? Does anybody actually believe that uh, that, that full quotum of, of, of dollars will be passed over to, you know, to actually you know, investigative journalism to, to highlight government rorts, et cetera? 
one thing, which is you're exactly right to point that out. The other thing I'd say is that the ABC and the SBS have also been included in the proposal as a last minute addition. And there's a real question as well, whether that extra source of revenue might not be a source for the expansion of those platforms, but in fact, a justification for further cutting their budgets by government. Yeah, that's a good point. Alex, do you have any comments that you'd like to, uh, to, to make on this issue? Uh, well, firstly, I, I just want to say, uh, you know, about, you know, uh, thank you uh, for the, the, the wonderful sort of uh, critique offered of News Corp and for sort of ghoulish um, old media gods. Um, in a way, I, I think there is a lot of opposition uh, from the old media monopolies to for new media. So, I mean, obviously someone like Rupert Murdoch, for example, made his money by denigrating actual print journalism and replacing it with a sort of tabloid version of it. Um, and this is, you know, he's already in a way responsible for, for decline in investigative journalism and for and, and sort of pushing investigative tactics on celebrity gossip effectively. <laughs> so investigative journalist techniques end up just, you know, uh, demeaning um, forms of public knowledge and understanding of actual complex issues. Um, so I completely agree that this is not a good step. And it seems a little bit too little, too late. Um, I think the death of print, sadly, has already kind of occurred. Um, and it would be great if it could be revitalized um, for all for reasons that seem very pertinent now regarding sort of fake news and so on, which isn't to say that the old news forms weren't also propagandistic. They clearly were. One only needs to read Noam Chomsky on the subject. But I think that uh, very, very often there has been this lack of sense of authority and where to go for news and so on. Um, I would, of course, recommend that people go to the green left uh, for the news. Uh, but yeah, so, I, you know, that would only be the only additions. I mean, I thought it was just beautifully summed up uh, by Lizzie. And... Yeah, look, I, look, I'm actually all for encouraging people to uh, to to check out the Green F more. Although I think there's, I think there is a bigger. That's not the whole answer to this question. I mean, I think even even a country like Sweden, as I understand it, uh, any publication with two thousand or more subscribers has got an automatic uh, mandate by the government to fund a certain number of journalists for that organisation. And that's not some you know mad socialist utopia. This is you know social democratic capitalist Sweden, um, assuming I've got the, the, the that, that fact correct. That's my understanding. Uh, there's different. There's certainly plenty of options for the government to be uh, both increasing the funding for community media and also public broadcasting. And I think especially in the case of the ABC, over the last uh, decade or two, we've seen a very sharp curtailment of, or I guess, a in, intense government pressure, uh, to, which has moved the ABC in a, in a much more right-wing direction than was the case uh, in, in the past. And uh, we need democratization of public broadcasting. So at the moment, the minister's got quite considerable control as to, as to who is the, who's on the board of the ABC, and the ABC board throws their weight around. Uh, so we need actually democratization of, of public broadcasting, in, in my view. Uh, go can, to, I want, can I want... Oh, sorry. No, go, Lizzie. You're going to jump in. Oh, well, I was just going to have one more point. So I think Alexander made a really good point about the decline of print journalism in general. And the other aspect of this code that probably doesn't get as much attention is that if you're a certain kind of news organisation and it's defined in the proposed legislation, so you have to be a particular size, have a particular amount of revenue. So Greenleaf might well be excluded because it doesn't meet the revenue requirements. Notwithstanding, they might contribute to a diverse media environment. So there's that problem there. But the other thing that comes out of this is if you're a media organisation, you get access to information about how algorithms work on these search platforms. So you can essentially create a form of media that's optimised for how these platforms work. And that, I think, is not what we need more of. We do not need more of the Daily Mail type journalism. That's not what's missing in the current media landscape. And what it really strikes me is, is an example of media organisations not criticising the data-centric model of these platforms, but in, in fact saying they want to get in on it, that they want to be able to optimise their own platform for revenue making using data about their, their people who arrive at their site, which is something they also will get access to under the code, as well as how any changes to the algorithm that might affect who gets to visit their site or where their links appear in the search platform. So it's really entrenching a form of online 
engagement with public discussions and news, which is one of the things many people find objectionable about this current moment. And I think that doesn't get enough attention. The last thing I'll say is, um, if you are a technically minded person, you know, Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web, has actually filed a submission against this code because at a very basic level, it undermines that fundamental principle of an open and free web, which is you have the capacity to link freely between websites. Now, you know, the Daily Mail, or I should say the Daily Telegraph can put up a paywall if it wants to, but you're not charging for linking itself, the act of linking, which is a fundamental part of the free and open web. So if, even if you're a technical person who only objects to this on the basis of um, the structure of the internet is going to be put into jeopardy, I think you've got a very strong argument there alone, let alone the other layers of, of media and, and journalism and, and in engagement in public life. Okay, let's move on to the question of uh, the public ownership of a search engine. The Greens have raised that this week, and I'd actually just like to play a clip now from Sarah Hanson-Young being interviewed by the ABC. People need to be able to have free and open access to that. Bit, but, bit replacing, of but replacing one corporation like Google with another big corporation like Microsoft yeah. doesn't solve the problem here. Sure, so but we're a, not... a bit of a different situation comparing libraries to this, though, isn't it? I mean, in terms of the logistics of this, how cheap and easy would it actually be to create a new search engine? Why not let the market respond and leave it to the likes of, of Bing and others? Well, what we've seen is that the market has failed here. The reason we've got this intervention being debated in the parliament right now is because the market has actually failed. Google has become far too powerful, so powerful that they can threaten the parliament, threaten the Australian community and say, if we don't get the laws we want, mm. we're going to pull the plug. We should never have allowed a big corporation to become so powerful. So... Maybe, okay, Gody, let's come back to you. What's, uh, what comments would you make about this uh, proposal from the Greens? Look, this is, you know, uh, I guess a step forward into basically fighting what I find is, and, and I'm quoting from Michael Quick's uh, article regarding the di digital colonization um, by these big tech corporate giants on behalf of, of the US. And so I think that, you know, as long as we can, we see these tech organizations um, basically um, dominating the economic sphere in in terms of um, that what we see on the internet, what uh, what search engines we use, control their architectural design, um, and engage in sur surveillance capitalism, and actually act as a conduit to uh, the U.S. state surveillance system, um, we uh, as Australians won't really have any say over um, the, the search engines and the, and the search functionalities that we use. Now, this basically the US, um, prior to um, this conversation with uh, Scott Morrison and Sundar Pichai, US government came in and stepped in and said, hey, Australia, you should scrap this proposed law. I mean, it's implicative of how much of a threat um, our, um, our, you know, governance, our self-governance would have on the U.S. and these um, big tech corporations. So uh, the Greens new law is essentially, you know, a really good alternative uh, to what um, Google and Facebook were, have been offering. I mean, they also, they had offered an alternative that was um, called like the Google News Showcase or the Facebook news, uh, news feed that they already, I think, implemented in the UK where aggregators would curate a list of um, uh, art, uh, news articles on a daily basis based on some algorithm um, and user interest to um, basically kind of uh, create like a kind of like a ministry of truth for, for news. And so what, I think what we do need to do is what the Greens are kind of proposing and say, well, if these companies can come, come and go as they choose, make, you know, threats to um, take away a key infrastructure that date for information that Australians use, then we don't need to tolerate these threats. And we can, um, and the Greens proposal is essentially a way to bring that kind of autonomy back to the Australian internet user. Um, and yeah, so uh, 
So yeah, and if you and to, to go into a little bit of what the Greens propose is that they would like to um, explore investing um, in a Australian, um, I guess, government funded uh, search engine, um, and essentially that kind of leads leads down the path of okay, well, um, you know, we will be offering. Um, like it could, it could go towards the, you know, the free software movement or the decentralization of the internet. So it's kind of a step forward to getting autonomy um, for internet users back into their own hands. I think uh, this proposal by the Greens definitely brings up the question of public ownership uh, of the big tech giants. And I want to explore that topic in a bit more detail. Uh, but first, I want to play another clip, and this is from, a, again, an interview with the ABC with uh, Stephen Schiller, who is a former CEO of Facebook Australia. These are dominant you know, kind of monopolies in their space. If you simply just remove them, it's very disruptive. Now, not just to, you know, hey, it's harder for me to find stuff on search because I'm using another search engine. They're threatening the information ecosystem and the news ecosystem of Australia, which is a pillar of democracy in this country. And to me, that's, you know, it's not Tim Tams off the shelves. This is, hey, we're, we're, we're going to screw with your democracy if we don't get what we want. And that, to me, is chilling. And, and, and I say that as someone who, uh, who's got a lot of love and, uh, and respect for Facebook and Google. So I listen to that and I think, hello, uh, isn't it already, isn't that, Stephen Schiller talks about uh, Google and Facebook's threat to democracy as if this is some hypothetical uh, you know, potentiality that might happen sometime in the future, whereas the reality is Facebook and Google already are significant threats to uh, to democracy in Australia in multiple ways. Um, not to actually over-exaggerate the extent of democracy we have in the parliamentary system, which actually does disenfranchise most people, but but nevertheless, these big, big tech giants in private ownership are a threat to democracy. Uh, public ownership seems like the obvious uh, answer to that, although that's obviously a very hard thing to consider uh, from Australia. Even if we had a socialist government in Australia, um, these tech giants are largely based in the United States or other countries. Now, setting up a publicly owned alternative is a like does seem like a good uh, first step. And on, you, know, you note that something like ABC iView doesn't have, as far like as far as I can tell, doesn't have the same sort of um, algorithm chasing and uh, you know force you to watch the next show um, in the way that you know, Netflix, for example, is always con continuously trying to keep your eyeballs on their screen. Um, so to me, I think a publicly owned search engine and and social media is a uh, is a is a positive thing to is to look for. Um, but again, like let's turn it over to uh, who wants to who wants to comment on this. Perhaps maybe, maybe Lizzie, do you have any comments on this? Yeah, I, to be honest with you, I'm a bit. Um, put off by this proposal. I, I think it's a kind of poorly thought through one that is, uh, in my view, kind of classic Greens. I, I understand where it comes from, but I'm not sure it's really engaged with the issues at play. I think there are a lot of interesting products out there that provide search that aren't owned by government, um, that are sometimes non-profit. Um, I also think uh, Google has produced a, a product that works. Uh, that doesn't mean that we have to accept the terms on which it's offered, but I don't think we should always automatically assume that a, a, a government-run, at least, alternative is going to be the answer in these contexts, not least because um, the other online experience, or well, the definitive experience of online life is the surveillance state. So people rightly feel concerned about governments watching what they're doing online uh, because governments work in partnership with private entities to watch what we do online. So what I would say about that is, I think we need to think a little bit bigger rather than um, government leading tech projects like this and perhaps look at creating a more diverse um, landscape for offerings of different kinds of search, um, you know, through different formats, through um, community run ones, through nonprofits and the like. And, and that would be a better outcome. I mean, the other thing I'd add into the mix here is a close observer of of government-sponsored tech projects is that they're extremely bad at doing it, uh, in part because they're motivated by their own interests, but also because they don't really invest in technology um, 
for it to work. It's, it's far too uh, simplistic. You know, something like the COVID Safe Act is a classic example where they outsource it to their mates in the Liberal Party um, to, to build an app that ultimately doesn't work uh, anywhere near as well as, as alternatives, like, for example, the Red Cross built a, built a contact tracing app, for example, that could have been adopted in Australia but wasn't. So I, I do think we need to address the problem of the centralisation of the the web that we were just talking about. And, and again, Tim Berners-Lee talks about the need to re-decentralise the web to stop these choke points of the internet like, that are privately owned, like Google and Facebook. But I think there's things that government does well or publicly funded things do well and things they do badly. And I think you're right to raise the ABC. I think the ABC is an example of a platform with a bit of extra funding and uh, the freedom to experiment could facilitate public participation in debates that currently mostly occurs, for example, on Facebook. Uh, and it could do it in a much more constructive way. I don't think the same is necessarily true for search, um, but you know, there's lots of ways in which you could start to explore and experiment with giving people power online that doesn't make them dependent on private platforms. And that's absolutely something we should pursue, but I think we should keep an open mind about what those formats look like. Yeah, on that note, I'd just like to sort of, uh, you know, say that I actually kind of agree with both positions, which is kind of an annoyingly sort of mediating role. But like, I think, I I think here some other limitations um, on the idea of having a public search engine. Uh, one is that. Firstly, people, as, as as Lizzie just said, are already so familiar with Google. It's really convenient. It's easy. We've been conditioned uh, by, you know, I tried to use uh, DuckDuckGo because it supposedly doesn't track your data. And it's, you know, supposedly gives you that sort of anonymity and it gives much more user power. But it also doesn't quite get quite the same results that Google does, right? It's still pretty, pretty good. But, it, you know, but I think people will go back to that because it's not really addressing that power imbalance between these big mega tech companies. And then, you know, the government of Australia brings out sort of a public search uh, engine. The other thing too, is that, I mean, Sarah Hansen Young gave the example of the ABC as a sort of independent body, but as you said, Alex, um, it's not so independent. I mean, Howard was stacking it with his uh, mates and so on, uh, on committees and advisory boards and so on. So, um, and even then for liberals, what they do is they just attack it and claim it's unfair, you know, for right-wing party to, to, to push it more right wing. Uh, similarly, nothing about the internet is neutral, you know, almost nothing anyway. So the idea that you could come up with this neutral search uh, is somewhat utopian. Um, and if by any chance it were miraculously successful, of course, that's just another uh, resource to then be privatized or rendered semi-private um, or whatever, right? So, uh, you know, often public infrastructure, when it works, uh, becomes privatized, right? Um, and that can be, you know, a huge sort of uh, problem in itself. Um, I am cautiously behind the proposal, nevertheless, for the reason, not that I think it would work, but because I think it does make a demand on the system and does try to change the coordinates of the conversation. Right? So I agree with Godi there that it does change how we think about it. Like the internet was developed uh, to a very large extent by public funds, right? Uh, both in terms of ARPANET, but also Wi-Fi was, uh, you know, for CSIRO played a key role in developing Wi-Fi and so on. Uh, you know, anything technological involves, you know, thousands of workers from different nations and so on, there needs to be some way of, uh, some way of thinking about how best to socialize the internet, how we can do this, of course, under capitalism, we can't do it under capitalism, right? Uh, but for more that we can actually realize the limitations and make impossible demands on the system, um, you know, for, for, for better kind of, you know, at, at least it hones consciousness or, on for limitations of capitalism, right? And so I would just strategically back it, but I don't think it would actually necessarily be that good if there were um, a public uh, search engine. So that's kind of my two cents on the issue. I think there, I think there is, there are obviously practical difficulties with any such moves like this to happen from Australia, uh, because you know the web is a worldwide um, institution as as it is, uh, but. There's also, I, as I, I can't see any long-term fundamental solution other than to bring the big tech giants under public democratic ownership and control. And 
so I guess the, I guess the question is what is what is the pathway towards that from here? Uh, Gota, you've got some comments. So just to comment on like why we are so you know still so wedded to well we just really want the you know Google search engine because it's really good, but it's just because of the technological um, hegemony um, and ideological domination that these tech companies have you know instilled on us. We haven't been able to. I mean we're just so, I think we've just become lazy tech, technology users. We're just, we just get a piece of software and then, you know, however it works, it just works. That's how we, we're going to use it or hardware. And I think that the internet and technology can be such a much bigger thing for the day, everyday user. If we had, if, you know, if we understood what was, you know, what was going on with our, with our data and our, uh, and our privacy and, and how we can like um, take that more into our control. Um, and so something like a publicly owned search engine, I think that the Greens had mentioned that this search engine would be accountable to the public. It would, uh, there wouldn't be any shareholders. So it there wouldn't be any profit motive behind it. And so because of, and because of that, we have, we may even have even more of a sense of, um, uh, more of a experimental or um, uh, beyond the box thinking on what the search engine could do. And th they've said that it would, you know, follow the global best practices on data and privacy standards. And essentially the users would own their own data and have control over what is being collected about them and how it's being used. Well, well I mean, I, I would agree with that. But of course, the problem would be that the Greens also aren't in government and therefore if by any miracle um, it were adopted, you could bet there'd be a bunch of tweaking about all those suggestions. Like I agree with the proposal. Like I, I, I endorse it. I, I think it is limited by the fact that yes, we have been conditioned to, uh, to, to almost enjoy using Google searches and to expect this sort of immediacy and to look a certain way, which you know, we, we need to find a way to shed, right? But I don't think we can, of course, put that on for personal responsibility. That's what every tech person, a big uh, tech company, CEO, or whatever will say is that, you know, there's these huge problems. And what we need to do is download apps that will stop us looking at these other apps. And what we need to do is just take personal responsibility, adopt a sort of digitally minimalist framework and whatever. So I don't think putting it on for personal is a great uh, response either. But I don't, I, I, you know, and I, so I do fully support that. I just think realistically, just being sort of honest uh, as a matter of strategy, I, I endorse that, that. That, that sort of policy. I just, I think realistically, it's going to be a bit like if we just on a very recent memory, let's think about the NBN and, and you know, for example, Labour's NBN was not perfect, but it was a hell of a lot better than the Liberal Party's NBN. That's the closest I will ever get to saying a positive word about the Australian Labour Party. But nevertheless, it was a lot better, right? And of course, what did the Liberal Party do when it came in power, right? You know, it, it, it destroyed any sort of uh, utopian hope for public optimism about a public works program of some kind, right? So there was a huge popularity behind the NBN because people do like the idea of public ownership, mm. right? They don't maybe come from that Marxist framework, which I believe they should, but they come from that sort of, well, we need to balance capitalism, we need to mitigate it. And they intuitively want to support something partly out of like patriotism or whatever that's Australian made or whatever. And they do like things that are public resources, right? And I mean, if you look at the key communists, some of the key communist theoreticians like Slavoj Žižek, Tony Negri, Michael Hart, Jody Dean, uh, even Alvaro Garcia Linera, who was vice president of Bolivia, remember, um, they have all stressed that communism and socialism needs to affirm the importance of the commons and the digital is part of the commons, that we need to look at these as public resources, not as private resources, right? Because we're already kind of treating it as though they're public resources. But then, of course, we realize that our data is being sold, uh, that we are, you know, to use Shoshana Zuboff's term, being surveilled as part of surveillance capitalism where even our searches even our posts and so on are being sold to advertising companies and 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 you know 
there's the idea that we ourselves are being hacked and controlled by these sorts of algorithms. So I think that's um, an important point to sort of remember. Yeah. One of the common uh, liberal answers or proposals in relation to big tech, as well as other big sections of the economy, is to break it up into smaller pieces, break up Facebook into smaller pieces, break up Amazon into smaller pieces, break up the big banks into smaller pieces. And I guess to me, I feel like that is an inadequate answer. Um, and really, it is, a, it is a question of public ownership. Yeah, public ownership and what goes along with that is democratic control that, is, that has got to be the answer. And I mean, you, know, you can sort of look at something like Australia Post has obviously been corporatized over the years. Uh, it obviously provides a lower quality service now than what it did in the past. On the other hand, if it were to be privatized, I'm sure uh, you know, some aspects would work very efficiently, but it would still be a profit run system and it would not, you know, it would, it would, uh, it would not work for, for more people. So given that, I guess, particularly in, in relation to that, I guess in relation to the idea that some liberals put forward about breaking up these big companies, and obviously other ideas have been expressed, Lizzie, perhaps you want to come in on any more comments on this? Yeah, well, I do think we have to contend if we consider ourselves of the left and critics of the state, we have to contend with the limitations of calling on the state to fund big tech projects. We can't just ignore that that's got potentially very damaging consequences in terms of building a new form of infrastructure of power that doesn't serve everyday people. I mean, I, I do think we need to be um, not so 20th century about it and say, oh, well, we need governments to build this because I, I don't think that might, that... I don't think that would necessarily work and I don't actually think it, it makes use of what's available. I think it's, it's stunning how much the debate about big tech has changed in the last four years. I think it's incredible that now the United States is talking, you know, it's held a number of inquiries, it's talking openly about potentially breaking up these companies. It would be an enormous step forward if WhatsApp was divested from Facebook. It would be an enormous step forward for any of these platforms to be broken up in any meaningful way. Now, it's not a total solution, but it's a way you start to have a discussion about how dominant they are in our lives and what we might be able to do about it. And I don't think we should just discard antitrust because it's not significant enough. I also, you know, to return to my original point, to, to talk about experimenting with different ways of owning things, the obvious working example that exists out there is in the top 10 most popular websites on the internet, which is Wikipedia, which is not run by a government. It's not um, supported by um, government money in, in a significant way. It's, uh, it's powered by users who contribute to the platform endless amounts of, of labor to make it work. Um, and it's, it's supported by donations and foundation money. Now, there may be an, a whole criticism of that, but there's no question but I think that serves users much better than any of the other centralized choke points that are privatized. And it would be remiss to ignore that as a potential alternative to a form of ownership. That is an incredible platform for a bunch of different reasons. It's got its limitations, absolutely. But in terms of watching how you facilitate disagreement on hotly contested topics, I mean, go and have a look at the article on the Capitol riots in, in, on the 6th of January, and you'll see an uh, um, uh, incredible kind of display of moderation, content moderation, in a time in which we're talking about how important that is, of um, mitigating and managing uh, conflict in a constructive way. So why would we ignore that example, um, for example, in this discussion and revert to this idea that um, government-run programs are the best? I mean, I think we can get too sucked into the Greens' ideology of how they think about these things. Um, and, 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 you know, we can certainly use it as a starting point because I think we all actually share the same objectives, which is to stop private companies ruining the internet and exploiting users and seeing them as a source of monetization through exploiting their data. So we need to stop that. But there's many tools at our disposal to, to kind of effect, put that into effect. And I, I don't think there's one single silver bullet. We're all pushing towards um, a decentralized form of ownership, whether that, what structure that takes, whether it's cooperative, whether it's user owned, whether it's donation funded. I think these things can be worked out after the fact, but I think we would be remiss to ignore other models that we see, both for legislative reform and working kind of platforms that service users. I think it would be remiss to ignore them in this present moment because we're potentially losing a source of incredible change and, and um, and an opportunity to open up our sense of possibility of what online life could be. Okay, yeah, some great points there. Now let's let's uh, move towards this sort of next section and talk about the question of free speech online, free speech and big tech. And I guess one of the big issues this year has been, and you mentioned the, the January 6th um, attack on the Capitol, uh, Twitter has banned Trump. That's been a, a, a big source of controversy on the left. I think um, not many people were shedding tears that, uh, that Trump was banned. On the other hand, 
we all can recognize that there is a big problem with private companies determining who is and isn't allowed to have a platform on these sort of worldwide communication platforms like Twitter and Facebook. Uh, maybe, um, Alex, do you want to make, uh, make some comments about the question of free speech and, and social media? Absolutely. So the first thing is when we talk about free speech, it's a very nebulous term, a very hard to define term what free speech is. There's lots of different traditions. John Stuart Mill, for example, was a very uh, significant liberal theorist of free speech. And he claimed that holding a placard at a demonstration saying that property was theft was censorable, right, and should indeed be censored. So it's quite funny that uh, you know, by by most standards and most frameworks, what Trump said and what Trump did uh, contravenes at least for liberal conception of free speech um, and therefore can be justly censored. But but there is another liberal argument, right? And of course, we're not liberals, you know, but just entertaining for liberal philosophical framework for a moment. Uh, there is another argument, which is that Twitter's platform is privately owned. Um, it therefore is not a public resource. And therefore, as a platform, Twitter has every right to sense and determine what goes on on its platform, right? I don't like this argument at all, right? The internet was publicly funded. It was created as a result of public funding. Uh, you know, it was not... Uh, it's not, no one uses these platforms in that way, right? Um, and of course, the problem too with this is that already uh, these platforms have radically changed the distinction between the sort of private banal speech, which happens to friends and neighbors, right? Uh, and for sort of agentive public speech. By agentive, I just mean something that will cause effects, right? Cause changes to society. Like if someone gives a speech saying something to the public, that has a sort of change or an effect, right? And traditionally for sort of more uh, domestic spheres of speech uh, or homely types of speech around the dinner table, whatever, uh, the type of censorship that goes on is just someone saying that's a stupid opinion or you're an idiot or whatever, that's the worst that goes on there. But uh, usually with some exceptions and caveats, but, but public speech has always been traditionally more censored, right? And that's kind of where for free speech arguments have kind of been historically directed toward. Uh, so social media already in a way collapses that sort of distinction a little bit because people, you know, sometimes will post anything, right? Um, and, um, it, less so than often is thought, actually, but but there's a level at which people sometimes post as if they're just talking to their friends and relatives, and then something goes, as the saying goes, viral. Okay, so there's a huge range of complicated issues here. What really interests me is the way that Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, framed it. So he said it's a big step, you know, censoring for president. It's dangerous, he said, in a series of tweets. It's very dangerous. We've entered dangerous territory. You know, here's our long list of sort of justifications. Were we right? He asked. Right. And then similarly, Mark Zuckerberg came out saying, you know, what we keep hearing from the community, from our community, is that people are sick of all the arguments online and, and they don't really want this to be a politicized space. Now, both CEOs have to talk like this, right? Because if they were to reveal that they had more power than the president of the United States, that would be something of a scandal. You know, we all kind of secretly know this. Uh, well, many of us know this, but you have to pretend that that's not true. And you have to blur the distinction between what are private activities, the activities of, you know, for, for, for CEOs, you know, who are immensely powerful, right? Um, and they have to claim that they're only responding to the public and the community, because otherwise it would actually be to admit, yes, these are private platforms, right? We have privatized and colonized the internet. So I think that's, you know, something that we should uh, bear in mind and keep in mind, okay? Gody, any comments from you about this uh, free speech and democracy on social media or online? Sure, I mean, it just the, I guess the Twitter, Trump Twitter ban kind of leads us to um, wonder, you know, how far can these organizations go? 
in terms of freedom of speech and who they ban and what they ban um, and who you can associate with online also. I mean, um, in I think that in general, um, I think Google has um, been, you know, um, found to be like censoring socialist views and Facebook has found to be in favor of mainstream liberal media. So saying that they're not involved in politics and then, and also um, regulating the freedom of speech and who you associate with is kind of, um, uh, it's gonna kind of have a, you know, a really, um, uh, I guess it questions, you know, how much you can, how much, autonomy and uh, a democracy exists in these platforms in the first place? Or you're, are you just beholden to their, their um, I guess, terms of use and what you can and can't say, it will fit right into what, what the mold of what they want to see on there. So it is, you know, it is a way to um, see how far this freedom of speech debate can, can go on, on these platforms, yes. Yeah, and I'll just add to that too, the extent to which we're being moderated by algorithms too, we're not being moderated necessarily by even people or moderators. So there is this, you know, there can be this mask of neutrality behind this as well, which is the other thing and the extent to which already where everything we say is being online is being shifted or changed in relation to algorithms. So it can sort of suggest a more insidious form of censorship because it's and even a more complete one, because you may or may not even be aware that you're being censored. And of course, any attempt to attack the far right and to argue that they need to be deplatformed will inevitably allow social media giants to use a both sides type of argument and censor both sides, right? Um, I'm not saying that we shouldn't necessarily celebrate for the, 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 uh, you know, the absence of a particular a particularly horrible president. Um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, this will and has arguably already been used to censor left wing voices online. Yes. So Lizzie, any comments from you? Yeah, well, like, it's a bit of a Gordian knot because um, you're, you're right, Alexander, there's, you know, Facebook doesn't even have content moderators in all of the countries in which they offer the platform. So let alone in the um, language, let alone in with an idea of the cultural landscape. So this is outsourced to people who work in miserable conditions. They have to follow a complex community set of guidelines, community set of guidelines that's drafted from a, um, you know, a, 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 you know, a Silicon Valley perspective. And, and what I'd say about that is, you know, Facebook is widely associated with, um, with driving genocide in Myanmar, for example, and that's well documented. Um, you know, various platforms have been used in all sorts of ways around the world outside of particularly the US to perpetrate um, violence against minorities. Uh, Facebook routinely um, through algorithm um, technology, but also generally um, censors people in electoral settings, but also does it really poorly. There's a memo that was put out um, from a former engineer that talks about the difficulty she had here, where she's having to determine um, how, how to manage misinformation in the context of an electoral environment that gets nowhere near the kind of attention that you might get for the US election. So Facebook's already organizing political affairs for people all around the world. So, you know, in some ways, I think that we do want more content moderation. We do want to have a way to limit people's voices in certain contexts. One of the really difficult things I think for the left is that um, it's clear that deplatforming works. And how do you contend with that? What do you do about that? Because of course you don't want to deplatform to, like deplatforming to become this tool that's then used against the left. But for someone like Milo, Milo it's worked effectively to, to cut him out of public life, ruin a source of income and silence him. And I think we need to really think about what that means because I, I don't cry any tears about that, but um, you, you realize the potency of the tactic. Uh, and, you know, you can see how this might play out already. Facebook talks about Zionism and how absolutely difficult it is to moderate content in relation to Zionism, especially when there's competing definitions of anti-Semitism. Um, and, and this is a term that can be used in an anti-Semitic way online, but often isn't and technically isn't, you know, because it describes something factually in a particular way, which isn't inherently anti-Semitic. So 
What I guess I would say about that is that content moderation is an incredibly difficult task to do at scale. And what I think we need to talk about is potentially finding ways to do it in a more localised way that perhaps has some federated principles or concepts, but to not pretend that it's, a, it's got straightforward answers. Now, of course, private companies are ill-equipped to do this. And in fact, their whole business model is based on things like virality, on keeping people on the platform, on micro-targeting, because that's their business model. All these things contribute to an awful experience online and contribute to, I think, bad tendencies politically that, that um, can exploit people, but also lead to things like violence and extremism and incentivize that. Um, so the business model, uh, the profit motive applied in this context is particularly poor, but I'm not sure it's always clear what the alternative is. And we need to start exploring that uh, and thinking really carefully about it. And I, I don't think there's any alternative except to return to more localised forms of self-governance um, that are specific to the particular place that you're in, that allow people to take a bit more um, ownership and, and, and responsibility for the freedom that they might have online so that they can relate to each other better as humans rather than as online avatars. And that might be one way, but it, it's a monumental task. And um, I don't think we should shy away from it. Uh, no, I, 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 I agree. But um, but I would also add to just as a level of strategy for those of us who think that the digital has any praxis work or, or value in terms of practice. Uh, I think too, we can we we can maybe risk a little bit of hypocrisy here because the alt right is very known for champion championing free expression, but what they do on a repeated level is use. Uh, these arguments as a mask or a cover, and in reality, they constantly report left-wing content online, and will even label it as fascist or right-wing just to get it taken off. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, if the right does it, maybe we can just strategically uh, push the uh, maybe the, the idea of more free expression. While in reality, um, as an aside, you know, we actually. Uh, don't practice what we preach. Um, and we, you know, because I mean, there's a justification here, like uh, Herbert Marcuse in the, I think, 60s, uh, wrote a great essay called Repressive Tolerance, which was the idea that um, we are constantly being repressed as the left and equated with the far right and so on, while the far right is actually given more airtime, right? Um, and is objectively more able to make inroads into the media. So he said that whatever we can do to censor the far right, we should do. <laughs> while at the same time pointing out all the times the left is being censored and pointing out the hypocrisy of the fact that the left is being censored, right? And so I thought that sort of strategy where on some level you divorce some moral, abstract, platonic considerations of what is ethically right versus the more Machiavellian tactics should indeed maybe be embraced by the left. So that's something I've been sort of thinking about. I'm not 100% sure, but that's something that that just on the level of practice, maybe we could we could adopt as you know people online. Whatever attitude we take towards the you know uh, platforming or deplatforming the far right uh, online, I uh, I think there's no way that can be seen as the as the main way of challenging the far right. And I think what the the, the January six um, the January six attack on the Capitol shows that this is a, a a like a practical issue in the United States and obviously a lot of other countries around the world. Um, Lizzie first, and then Gary. Lizzie, do you want to make any comments on that? Well, I mean, of course you're right. So, in the sense that where do conspiracy theorists, where does the alt right come from? Where does it find its traction? Why did seventy people, million people, vote for Trump? Like, it's not something that you can just put down to the structure of social media. I think social media optimizes the kinds of tendencies we've seen. And so it's a structural problem we have to confront. And I think it would be naive to say that this is not a, um, a it's not telling that it's occurred during the era of social media. But I, I think there is a reductive tendency to blame this all on online spaces as being the key driver that causes it, when in fact they're are social political reasons why um, a set of people adopt nativism, bigotry, um, and um, I guess closed-mindedness as a response to economic crises and health crises as they occur. And you know what I'm not convinced of is that the, the Democrats are a particular solution to that. Um, I think there's tre trends within it uh, and a shift that, um, that it's not a, a unified party, which is in many ways a good thing for that reason. Um, but I, I would say as well, I don't think. I, I think we're going to, we shouldn't neglect um, 
reforming social media experiences, finding structural ways to attack the causes of um, that, that, that give rise to extremism, that incentivize people to stay on platforms, to find solutions that they might otherwise not find, um, not because we want to censor them, but because uh, it's a tendency that is creating uh, the tools for the right to organise. So I, I just think we shouldn't, it's not solely a technology problem, but it's also not, not a technology problem. Uh, and we need to contend with both. Gody, any comments from you about this issue? I was just going to say, um, you know, what, what drives, like, these, for these conspiracy theorists and people who, that, you know, went to the January 6th riot on the Capitol, you know, what drives these people there? We saw that, um, you know, a lot of them had moved to this other um, Twitter-like platform called Parler, but also these, you know, the social media platforms also have algorithms that kind of, you know, YouTube has, an, you, you know, you go down that YouTube rabbit hole, you go to, and, and, and the content, you know, once you click on something, they, the, the platforms continuously drive you to these, you know, extremist thoughts. So it's not, it's not necessarily um, um, fair. I mean, I, I know we're not taking the blame away from them, but it's not, it's not fair to say that they um, aren't, aren't involved in this kind of, um, I don't know, indoctrination but also an encouragement of the type of speech that you, you see on there. Yeah, I mean, I think I don't think anyone is saying that social media is totally to blame for people fe feeling insecure, anxious and alienated and therefore going toward um, the alt-right or that there aren't histories of misogyny and sexism and class uh, tensions and so on that have driven people toward um, quite frankly sometimes totally insane conspiracy theories uh, but it would be foolish to ignore that for example as people have spent time online there's been more radicalization uh, more QAnon followers it, you know QAnon was starting to die before COVID right but then more people were online and therefore more exposed to this stuff as well as there being you know a, a, a disease which you know or an illness that's you know inherently mysterious and therefore people want to seek explanations anyway but so I think it would be foolish to ignore the fact that sometimes the alt-right use quite sophisticated methods of radicalizing people uh, in very cynical ways online. So, for example, one on, on, on just the issue of depoliticizing Facebook, uh, I always get anxious about what is and isn't considered political, for example, right? And so on message boards online and on Chan boards and so on, one tactic for right the alt-right will use is to use ironic humor, uh, nasty jokes and so on, and say, this is not political, you know, it's obvious that I'm being hyperbolic here, right? Then people will, you know, give like, you know, a sort of post about why this is an offensive, disgusting comment, and they'll say, oh, come on, it's free expression, it's, it's not politically meant, it was just a joke, lighten up. And then the person who's criticizing the sort of racist post will end up being banned because they're for one bringing politics into it or by talking about institutional theories of racism or whatever, right? So the alt-right has been very sophisticated in how they've played it and we ignore it at our peril. I mean, it, it, it is growing um, in a variety of ways. QAnon, for example, is attracting people sometimes from the left spectrum, sometimes from different spectrums that are very different, distinct from, I mean, they are QAnon Reiki sessions, for goodness sake, okay? So these are not, these are not things that are traditionally right-wing people becoming radicalized into sometimes fascist movements, right? That's part of it. But it's not just that. Now, I know we can overstate the effect of technologies and there's a tendency because capitalists are so fetishistic of tech. You know, they talk about these devices as if they're magical, that we want to, of course, deny that, deny that mesmerism, right? And, and we should. You know, I, I, I tried to write a whole book on that subject, right, about how we can overstate the role that, that technology plays and how technology is really being manipulated by capitalists and capitalism, right? But, uh, but it, it is very much a concern. And there is a here and now question, which is how we approach it. We should, of course, focus on the economic causes as well that cause people to go toward these extreme 
um, and dangerous positions. Uh, no one, I think, would deny that. Can I just I think quickly? Actually, I know. Go, Lizzie. I, know, I, just, I just wanted one quick comment, which is, I agree with you, Alexander, but I would say there are people who do blame it solely on tech, which is uh, politicians. So in the wake of the Christchurch, Church, Christchurch massacre, we had legislation passed in Australia in a matter of days, so under a week, which bans the, the posting of violent and abhorrent material online. And uh, this is just an astonishing um, disrespect for the democratic process because there was going, almost no time to comment on it. Of course, it comes from a place where you can understand. Nobody wants to see a live stream of the Christchurch massacre. Equally, though, it's very easy for politicians to say, oh, well, you've got sophisticated algorithms. You should be able to stop this before it starts. And meanwhile, you know, Facebook then, I, I just read an article this morning, talked about banning a group that posts material about protests because it was seen as confronting imagery. That, you know, a, a, a police shooting that's caught on camera might be considered violent and abhorrent content. So these things always muddy very quickly when it comes to actual practical examples. But the people we need to watch is the po are the politicians who do exactly what you're describing, blame it entirely on the tech platform because it's much easier than contending with what they themselves might have contributed to in the form of extremism and what right nationalists. So I think we'd all be um, in agreement on that front. But I think what we need to do as the left is to be alert to that tactic and to not let them get away with it because it feels uncomfortable defending online platforms and tech companies when confronted with legislative reform like this. I don't want to be there defending Google from, you know, or Facebook from being censored in this way by government. But I also understand why that principle is really troubling, that governments shouldn't be able to blame political problems on tech platforms and legislate accordingly in ways that can have terrible unintended consequences and, and are very difficult to undo. And this is a constant struggle, I think, being a digital rights activist, that you end up having to make these arguments that can feel incredibly lonely. And I think as the left, we need to get better at building up our capacity to make those claims, to be able to walk and chew gum, to be able to make a claim in defence of free expression online because there is a very important role that it plays in terms of accountability of power um, without letting politicians use the, the, the rhetoric of blaming platforms for this kind of extremism to distance themselves from their responsibility. Also, um, just adding to that, uh, in a different way, uh, the election of Trump, for example, was very much blamed on Russian hacking and um, online manipulation and so on. Because here we had the most qualified candidate in history running for president. You know, we had someone who, you know, had all the experience, was a smart lady, right? Uh, you know, we, you know, and then you had this bunch of deplorables, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, the, the, the idea was, oh, well, it has to have been this mysterious machinery of, you know, Cambridge Analytica, uh, Putin and so on, which isn't to deny, you know, the sinister quality of Cambridge Analytica, but it, it prevented any sort of soul searching or any shift toward the left that could perhaps happen with the Democrats, because it was this idea, not that the Democrats would ever have shifted properly left, but it was a way of saying, oh, no, it wasn't because Hillary Clinton took a technocratic micromanagement stance while fully endorsing a whole set of policies that had disenfranchised people and alienated them, right, is not because of the responsibility of her and her husband or for Democrats more generally or for failure of the Obama administration mm -hmm. to, to, to actually enact meaningful change. Oh, no, it was Russian bots, right? It becomes that easy answer. So in a different example, you know, I, you know, I completely, you know, agree with you, yeah. I think uh, one thing I wanted to, I guess, well, obviously we're coming to the end of our time, um, but I think, I guess, one one point I think we should finish with, or at least make clear in this in this situation, is that the the far right can only grow in a context where they can actually build up an audience, and that is okay. Obviously, no one is going to deny the role of the the tech platforms in in creating that possibility. On the other hand, in terms of combating them. Uh, we need to actually build up a practical alternative, an alternative not just to the far right, an alternative to the mainstream, because the far right can only grow in the context of the mainstream. So we need popular mobilisation and we need to have practical socialist answers if we want to actually undercut the, um, the strength of, of the far right. As I said, we're sort of we're coming to the end of our time. I wonder if we may just uh, briefly, all three of you can make some, some final comments, just a, a few, few moments each. Alex first. Well, I mean, I, you know, uh, I, I think that's true. I think we're all roughly in agreement about the dangers of the debate and we have to get better at it. I think a big part of it too, but the, the appeal of the alt-right and of conspiracy theories is that they provide a story. 
um, and that they approximate some aspects of truth. You know, for example, there are indeed pedophile rings that have been sort of exposed. There are these, you know, horrible power imbalances. Um, but they have a fantastical fantasy fairy tale story, whereas we as Marxists, as leftists, actually understand what's going on. We have to find a way and get better at communicating uh, how to address these very serious problems and issues facing us, right? Lizzie? Yeah, I mean, I suppose as someone who considers themselves a leftist and in, is involved in digital policy debates all the time, I, I guess I'd put a plea out there for more leftists to become involved in it, um, in part because there's almost no issue which um, isn't touched by technology in the modern age or some technological issue, and we need more left-wing perspectives participating. And it's it can be very, um, it raises all sorts of thorny debates that I think on the left, we haven't necessarily had to be required, well, we haven't been required to kind of um, clarify, like what is the role of the state? Um, how do we hold, you know, what do we do about uh, unaccountable corporations? What kind of solutions can we pose in the here and now that might not be perfect, but could advance a particular worldview? And um, I, I would just welcome anyone, even if you, you don't have to have a computer science degree or, or a background in media studies in order to contribute to this debate, um, but we are, you know, there are ways that you can um, engage meaningfully and learn and, and um, hopefully teach others who are already within it. And I'd put a plea out there. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to discuss this um, and get it out to the Green Left audience. And I, I would encourage people if they're kind of interested in these topics and perhaps don't, perhaps don't feel that like they're technically qualified to comment, that, that I would discourage you from feeling underconfident in that respect and, and try and encourage you to become part of these um, movements and discussions so that they can be stronger and, uh, you know, start to build a world that, that gives rise to human flourishing in online spaces, uh, because that's, I think, something we all agree is really important. Gody, any final comments? Yeah, I, I just think that, you know, uh, we as socialists or, um, need to um, push more for a democratic and uh, user-friendly or user or aut autonomous model of technology today. Um, I think that we can do that through the free software movement, through inter, um, internet decentralization, and open our minds to what, te what technology and the internet could be for the people, rather than for these um, big tech corporates who are using it to uh, extract and exploit um, the, the users and, uh, and and the world. So I think, I think that, yeah, we need to have an open mind and really um, see the potential of technology from a more uh, socialist standpoint. Thanks all three of you for your comments. Thanks everybody for watching us, uh, watching this show today. Um, we're going to leave it there, but before we go, I just would like to remind you that if you're not yet a supporter of Green Left Weekly, please, uh, please uh, push the support button and, and show us a bit of love. And secondly, that uh, it's our 30th anniversary, so we're welcoming messages of support for that 30th anniversary. Thanks, everyone.